In March of 2019, the Washington Post released an article with the headline, quote, Americans are getting more miserable, and there's data to prove it, end quote. In the article, they cite a survey where they had you choose between numbers one, two, and three, one indicating that you're not very happy and just happy with life in general, number one, not very happy, two, somewhat happy, three, very happy. In the 90s, we were pretty close to the very happy number, but there was a significant drop from when this was released in the 90s, so over the course of some 20 years or so, many more people were choosing one, not happy at all. This shouldn't come as much of a surprise because, first of all, we live in an increasingly godless society. Not just that people are moving away from the Lord and from Christ, from Scripture, but to a different religion, but just into secularism where there is no God and they don't hold to any sort of faith or religion. But also, we live in such a stuff-driven society. Companies spend billions of dollars each year to convince you that the stuff that you have is not as good as the new stuff that they are selling you. It's time to upgrade. It's time to buy something new. It's time to get this new thing, this new, that, and the other. Several years ago, there were 45 companies in 2018, 45 companies that each spent over $1 billion in marketing. Why? Because they want to convince you that the stuff you have is not as good as the new stuff. This, along with our own fallen natures, has created an incredibly discontent society, ever chasing what is newer, brighter, fancier, nicer, faster, better, stronger, so on and so forth. Christians are not impervious to this temptation to discontentment, are we? Churches play into this as they pursue brighter lights, bigger screens, newer music, nicer stages, and so on. Americans, we are perhaps the wealthiest people ever to walk the planet as a people, yet we're increasingly discontent. And as Christians, we should be the most content of everyone, because we know the King of glory. The old Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs wrote a wonderful little book. It might be in the library. It's entitled, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. His title alone tells you that this quality, this disposition of the heart is rare. And this is, folks, in the 1600s. That this quality of contentment is a rare jewel. Though we as Christians should be the most content of all, we are often found lacking contentment. This quality is precious in the eyes of our Lord, no doubt. And that's why Burroughs calls it a jewel. But what is contentment? Is this just one of those Christian words that you say? To make people feel bad because they wanted to buy a new pair of shoes? Is that what Christian contentment is all about? And how can we cultivate contentment in our hearts, especially in an increasingly unhappy, dissatisfied, discontent, and overly commercialized society? Well, for starters, I want to say that there is a marked difference between Christian contentment and the contentment that the world has. The contentment that the world has is up and down. It fluctuates dependent upon the situation, dependent upon whether or not we got the raise or not. But Christian contentment is completely different. It is based entirely on the supremacy and worthiness of Christ Jesus. I love the way that Burroughs defines contentment in his book. He said, quote, Christian contentment, listen closely, is that sweet inward quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition, end quote. 
every condition. Therein lies the difference between Christian contentment and the world's contentment. This morning we're going to visit a very familiar passage in order to look at four ingredients of Christian contentment. So if you would, please take your Bible and stand with me as we read Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. This is the word of the living and true God. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Father, we have your word open here before us, and we ask that you would open our eyes and open our hearts to see great and wonderful truth from your word. Lord, I pray that as I stand here today, that I would only speak what's true, right, and edifying. Lord, I pray that you would use this time together to benefit and edify your people so that we can grow in Christ's likeness, Lord. Help us to cultivate this sweet, inner, quiet, gracious frame of spirit being satisfied in Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. The first ingredient or first aspect or first part, whatever word you would like to use, the first element of Christian contentment involves trust in God's providence. Trust in God's providence. That's verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. As many of you know, this letter was written by Paul when he was a a prisoner. In chapter 1, he explains that he has been imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. Paul was certainly no stranger to hard times, was he? He would often find himself in prison. Many have joked that when Paul visited a new city, He didn't ask how the hotels were, he asked how the prisons were. Here, Paul finds himself imprisoned once more, and he sets out to write a a letter of thanks of sorts to the Philippians. This epistle is often regarded as having joy as its central theme. And as you read through the letter to the Philippians, you can see why some might, might say that. Because words for joy, rejoice, and glad are used 16 times. In these four chapters alone, Paul is making a point in this epistle that though he is in prison, though he is in good spirits, he wants the Philippians to follow his example and rejoice in every situation. This church, the church at Philippi, holds a special place in the heart of Paul. He tells them in the opening of the letter that he always thanks God in all of his remembrance of them in every prayer of his. And why? Because they partnered with Paul from the very first day of his ministry. They were the only church that was actually supporting him. If you look down in chapter 4, he says that in verse 14. He says that they were the only church that supported him when he first began his gospel ministry. He's thanking them here in our little passage for their revived concern for him. We don't know whether they sent money or clothing or food or what, but we do know that many commentators believe it's been about 10 years since the church of Philippi has been able to send Paul any sort of support. That's why he says that now, at length, I will admit that is a very strange way of rendering this here in the ESV. It would be better to say that now, the Lord, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last, or after a long while, you have revived your concern for me. Because it's been about 10 years. The language that Paul goes on to use here is really colorful. The word revived in the original is a horticulture word, and it refers to a flower blossoming. Their love for Paul is in full blossom once more. You know, we're in the early stages of spring. 
And you can already see some of the trees beginning to blossom. Actually, on the way here, there's this beautiful blossoming purple tree in the middle of the park off the highway. But there's a, a tree right outside of my office at home. And I love winter. You know this. You know how much I love winter. But there is nothing that compares to the beauty of life returning to the tree or to the plant or to the flower. It's a beautiful thing to look at. You don't have to have a green thumb to know that, by and large, the budding and blossoming of trees and plants and flowers is seasonal. In the same way, Paul's language here in saying, you had no opportunity, it means you didn't have the chance. It it wasn't the season for this. It wasn't the season for your love to blossom for me, but now it is. Paul isn't upset with the Philippians. Isn't that remarkable? It's been 10 years and Paul's in prison. But he's not writing, writing this letter saying, it's about time, you ungrateful, unloving bunch of church folk. Paul thanks them instead and he thinks of them in the best of light because he knows they love him. He says, you were indeed concerned for me. He doesn't say, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that you came to your senses and finally decided to love me. You stopped loving me for so long. He's saying, you revived your concern for me. You were concerned. You've always loved me. You've always cherished our relationship just as I have. You just haven't had the opportunity to show your love for me. In other words, it just wasn't the season for blossoms yet. Paul can say this and think of them in the best light because he knows who orders seasons and times. He knows that God is in control of all things at all times in all ways. He knows that ultimately even this gift that they gave him, it comes from the Lord. You cannot have Christian contentment without trusting in divine providence. For you must believe that you do have what you have, and you have it because the, it's from the Lord. And what you don't have, that's also from the Lord. What is providence, though? Often we might think that providence is just a synonym for sovereignty. While they are closely related, sovereignty speaks more of God having the right ability and power to do whatever He pleases. John Piper has written a really great resource on this topic. It's actually just called Providence. And he speaks of providence as being God's purposeful sovereignty. That God has a purpose in his ordaining of whatsoever does come to pass. Namely, his purpose is to do good to his children and bring glory to his name. So in saying that Paul exemplifies trusting in divine providence here, what we're saying is that Paul understands that though it's been 10 years, though he finds himself in prison even now, he understands that nothing can befall him outside of God's good plan to do good to Paul and bring glory to God. Paul exemplifies this in his life. We see this in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. He's detailing his imprisonment. He's saying that his imprisonment has actually served to advance the gospel. How many of us would find ourselves in prison and, and, and write this letter of poor me, woe is me, feel sorry for me. Could you send me a blanket, please? It's cold in here. But here is Paul saying what happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. They thought they had me. They thought they were impending the work of the gospel, but this imprisonment has only served to help the advancement of the gospel. Paul understood that even in this terrible situation of being imprisoned, that God was seeing to it that his plan and purposes would not be thwarted. After all, Paul is the same one who wrote Romans 8.28. It says, we know that for those who love God, All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. You know, it's so easy for us to see things happening or not happening in our lives and get frustrated 
upset, sad, anxious, so on. And why do we let these emotions get the best of us and dictate how we respond? Because we want to be in control. We want to direct the situation. And when things happen that are outside of our control, it bothers us. We want to keep the bad things from happening, and we want to make the good things happen. We want to stop when we want to stop, and we want to go when we want to go. We want to order all things in our lives according to our own plan, our own timeline, and our own goals. Now, I know if we pulled the room, nobody would say that. Nobody would say, yes, I want to order my life according to my own plan. I believe that every one of you would say, no, I want God to have his will done in my life. But what do the trials reveal about what's in the heart? Think of it here. Paul could have been very upset about this situation. He's in prison. He's in literal chains. And here it's been 10 years since the Philippians showed their love for him. I mean, okay, maybe, maybe 10 months, maybe three years, maybe even five. But 10 years what would you have thought? Well, nobody loves me. Nobody appreciates the things I do for them. Nobody understands. Nobody cares. If we're honest, what so often fills our hearts, minds, and mouths when things don't go as we would like is grumbling. Grumbling and murmuring and complaining. Rest assured, friends, contentment does not live in the same heart as grumbling, complaining, or whining. Those are not fruits of the Spirit. They are fruits of the flesh. We often know, intellectually speaking, in all situations, yes, that God is sovereign. I know, God is sovereign. But what we struggle with is is moving that understanding from our brains to our hearts. Because when it's moved from our brains to our hearts, It produces in us calm and peace and quiet and contentment, knowing my Father is in control of this. My Father. Not just some off, far distant deity. My Father. He's the one who's in control. We want to replace our grumbling instead with quiet trust. To trust in any, in every situation, whether great or small, that God knows what He's doing. But seriously, God knows what He's doing. God knows what He is doing. Did you know that? He really does. But on top of that, He's a really good Father. And even now, even when it doesn't feel like it, He's taking care of you. Whether it's withholding or granting, God is taking care of His children and He will never abandon them. So when He takes you through difficult times or things don't go as you would like, contentment begins with trust in divine providence. The second ingredient would be satisfaction in God's provision. Look at verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. Are you kidding me, Paul? Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. After expressing his great joy that the Philippians have revived their concern for him, he's, he's giving us a few words of clarification. First, he clarifies that he didn't mean that the Philippians didn't care about him. He wasn't saying, you, you careless Philippians, you don't care about me. We just looked at that. Now he wants to be clear that he isn't saying this because he was in great need. It would be expected for one to rejoice when provision is made for them in their hour of desperate need. Of course you rejoice because your, your needs have been met. That's a wonderful thing. This word here for need can also be translated as poverty. <laughs> Paul is in prison saying, not that I'm speaking from a place of poverty. Can we just have a moment and say, are you kidding me, Paul? Come on. You have chains on you right now. Really, Paul? You, you, don't, 
You're not speaking from a place of need. Yes, you are. You have need, don't you? What does he go on to say? I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He can say this and he can mean it because he has learned in whatever situation he is to be content. The word in the original for learned indicates having learned by experience. Paul has been through a lot. Shipwrecks, beatings, mocking, the list is endless. He has learned to be content in all situations. The word for content here is very interesting. It comes from the Stoics, from the philosophers. It meant to be self-sufficient, independent, which is kind of a strange thing for a Christian apostle to say, I have learned to be self-sufficient. Commentators point out that the Stoics would teach contentment or self-sufficiency as as this sort of being aloof of whatever happens in your life. That if you get sick, you shrug it off and say, I don't care. If you lose your job, I don't care. You lose your family, I don't care. It seems to have been a way to teach the individual not to be too emotionally invested. Paul is saying that they might have their idea of what contentment is. They think Contentment is this self-sufficiency, aloof, being aloof of, of all things in my life. But that's not what Christian contentment is. It's not being falsely detached from reality. We know that's not what it is. We know Christian contentment would not completely disregard the human experience. After all, Paul is expressing how grateful he is for the Philippians' gift. In chapter 2, he expresses how grateful he is to God for God having mercy upon him and healing Epaphroditus so that he didn't have sorrow upon sorrow. Christian contentment is not detached from reality. Christian contentment is finding satisfaction in whatever it is that God provides. If he provides much, you're satisfied. If he provides a little, you're satisfied. This is why Paul can say, not that I'm speaking of being in need. As Americans, this is a tough lesson for us to learn, isn't it? Jesus told us, do not store up for yourself treasure on earth, but in heaven. We say, amen, hallelujah. And Monday morning, what are we doing? Storing up for ourselves treasures on earth and not in heaven. Our culture is built on bigger, better, faster, stronger, newer, shinier. We drink water From a bottle. Could you imagine inventing this, by the way? I know what to do. People can get water for free right now from their well. But what if we sell it to them? And we put it in a really harmful material. And then we come up with a fancier water and sell it for $5. I bet you people will go for it. It was a brilliant idea. We have in-home coffee machines. Hallelujah, somebody. We have a choice of what to wear. We have hair products. We have TVs. We have a furniture to relax on. We have pillows just for decoration. Just because they're pretty. We carry around incredibly advanced computers in our pockets. We have the Bible. Do you realize that people bled and died so that we could have the Bible in our English language? William Tyndale, who is regarded as the father of the English Bible, was called a heretic and burned at the stake for working on the English Bible. We have the Bible in multiple translations, different kinds of leather, many different print and font options. We even have the Bible in any version available for you for free on the computer that you have in your pocket. We are absolutely filthy rich Christians. If you look at church history, as a people, no group of Christians as a people has ever been as wealthy as we are today. Yet we're the ones saying, I have need of this or that or the other. And here is Paul teaching us all a lesson from prison, saying, not that I'm speaking of being in need. Yet if there was ever, if there was ever a group profoundly discontent people. It's us. 
we never find satisfaction. We as Christians buy into the same lie as any other American that we too, we too need bigger, better, faster, stronger, newer, nicer, and shinier. We work hard, so we deserve nice things. Though we would affirm the contrary, we end up looking at ourselves, our work, and our ability as the reason for our provision. How do we know? Because we say things like, I work hard, so I deserve it. Flying in the face of all of the banner ads, the loud commercials, and the stuff, here is Paul, the prisoner, living in absolute contentment, probably with a smile on his face, chained up, unable to move about freely. He can't go and engage in the ministry that he wants to engage in. And what is he saying? I have need of nothing. I have need of nothing. Christian contentment is a rare jewel indeed. And isn't that beautiful? To gain some insight into the mind of Paul and how it is that he arrives at this precious virtue of contentment, listen to what he wrote to his understudy, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. In other words, we'll be content with our basic needs being met. It's interesting that he mentions food and clothing, isn't it? Because guess what Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 6? That God, your Father, provides for you. Food. And clothing. He said, God provides for the birds of the air. He provides for them food. And are you not worth many, more than many sparrows? God provides clothing. He beautifully uh, uh, covers the lilies of the field. And they're thrown in the fire tomorrow. And are you not of more value than lilies? So he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat and wear, what you're going to wear. These are the things that People who are lost care about, he says. That's what Gentiles care about. You seek first the kingdom of God, and your Father will provide for you. Matthew 6, go read it. Your Father knows what you need. Paul uses this language of being self-sufficient because he knows the secret of being content does not actually have anything to do with what you have or with what you don't have. This is where we get it wrong. Contentment is not based upon our abundance or our lack. We forget in this. We deserve nothing. If we live at the poverty level, we work at all sups as a cashier making fried burritos for the rest of your life when you used to be a millionaire. That is more than you deserve. How can we say that? Because you deserve death. You deserve the wrath of God. You deserve to be separated from God forever. You deserve that. We think, I work hard, I deserve it. But what we deserve that we have worked for, Scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. So then, friends, anything beyond that, Anything beyond that is an unthinkable mercy, an unthinkable grace of God upon our life. So how dare we look at the Son, the precious Son that spilled His blood for us, and then look at anything beyond that that God has decided to provide and say, it's not enough. I need more. I need something better than this. I work hard, God. I deserve it. In those moments, can we truly say that our eyes are on Christ? Can we truly say that what I have been thinking about and saturating my mind with is things above? I don't think so. In those moments, we have been thinking about things that are here on this earth, things that promise your satisfaction but never give it to you. Do you know why Americans are more unsatisfied, dissatisfied, and unhappy today more than ever? Even though we have more stuff than ever? 
is because more stuff will not satisfy you. Things that belong to a, pa- a world that is passing away, and I mean all things that belong to a world that's passing away, cannot satisfy your spiritual needs. Only Christ Jesus can do that. He says, why do you work for bread that does not satisfy? I'm bread. Come, eat, and drink without money. Contentment has nothing to do with abundance or lack. It is finding satisfaction in whatever God provides, whether it's a little bit or a lot. You know who else exemplified that? Job. He said, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our third ingredient is independence from life's circumstances. It's very closely tied to what we just covered. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to, ab- how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Let's revisit the definition of contentment from Jeremiah Burroughs. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. To be satisfied with God's provision is to freely submit to and delight in God's wise and fatherly disposal. It is not grumbling outwardly or inwardly. You know, it is entirely possible to grumble inside and nobody ever knows it outside. Christian contentment involves submission, which is putting yourself under what God says and does. But it's also delighting in what God has provided. It's not just, well... This is what I have. I guess I'll be content. I guess I have to be content with this. I guess. Church, that's, that's so often what marks many of our mouths, all of us, myself included. How often do we feign contentment when inside what's, our hearts are full of complaining and grumbling? Why? Because we're not living independent from our circumstances. Paul exemplifies this. He he exemplifies delighting in what God provides. We saw that in verse 10, where he said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And you know, we have no idea what they provided. Maybe it was a piece of bread. (laughs) Maybe it was great provision. We have no idea, but Paul is saying, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Paul is not celebrating the gift so much as being satisfied with what God has provided. But he is this way because he's learned the secret of contentment. Commentators say that this word secret was a word that was often used to speak of being initiated into the secrets of pagan religions. It seems that Paul is using this word to indicate to us not everybody gets it. That's why he calls it a secret. So then, my friend, Let us be very careful to automatically assume, oh yeah, contentment, I got that. Oh yeah, content, I'm content, definitely, no problem. Yeah, content, yeah, yeah, definitely. I I mean, look look at my life, I'm definitely content. Paul calls it a secret. He says, I've learned the secret. So then what should we do? Tell me, what's the secret? How do you do it, Paul? How do you find contentment? Because I'm struggling with it. And I want to be content. In learning this secret, it empowers Paul to live independent of his circumstances. He knows how to have a little and how to have more than enough. He knows how to go hungry and to have more than his fill. Many of us never live in contentment because we base our contentment on our lot in life. We base it on the amount of money in the bank. So when the number in the bank is bigger or smaller... We are happier or not as happy. When it's, we also base it on how people think of us. So when we're everyone's friend and everyone loves us, we're happy. But when people don't treat us the way we think we deserve to be treated, we're not as happy. 
My friends, this is not Christian contentment because Christian contentment has nothing to do with the circumstances of life. It has nothing to do with mountaintops or valleys. The apostle says it clearly. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. I know how to be content in anything. Whether I'm facing plenty or hunger, abundance or need, he knows the secret in any and every circumstance. But isn't it interesting that he says he knows how to abound? Wouldn't we all say, yeah, I do too. <laughs> I, yeah, it's easy to be content when you abound. But how many celebrities do we see that are committing suicide? How many very wealthy people that are in the public spotlight come out as being frauds, acting fraudulently, or, or engaging in all sorts of nefarious behavior, things that we wouldn't want to talk about in the church setting? How often does this happen? Constantly. And these are wealthy people who are well-known and well-loved and sought-after people, incredibly discontent. Paul is saying you need to know how to abound. There was a man in Luke chapter 12 who Paul, Jesus tells a parable of, who had stored up. He, he was in abundance. His, he had a great big harvest. He said, what, what do I do with this huge harvest? He looked at his barns and said, that's not big enough. I need a bigger one. I know what I'll do. I'll make a bigger barn. I'll move everything into there. And then I'll sit back and relax the rest of my life. The text says, he says to himself, soul, eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy your life. That sure sounds a lot like American plan of retirement, doesn't it? Let me store up for myself a great big wealth and then just kind of watch the clock tick until my hour is up. And until then, let me eat, drink, and be merry. Do you know what goes on to happen? That person is receiving judgment. The point that Jesus is making, your contentment, your joy, the treasures you store up, must not be here. Friends, this world is passing away. It is perishing. We will never find contentment in this world. We can find moments of fleeting happiness, but nothing that's new or better, faster, or fancier will ever satisfy our soul. More is never enough. You can live on the mountaintop and be discontent, and you can be discontent in the valley. Paul knew both, perhaps better than anyone, didn't he? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Just listen, listen to the things that Paul has been through. He's, been, he's had more, far more imprisonments with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, exposure and apart from other things. There is the daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all the churches. I don't know about you, but that's deeply convicting. If anyone could be discontent, it's Paul. If anyone had a reason to say, I deserve better than this. I deserve more than this. Look at all that I've been through. If anyone had a reason for that, it's Paul. And what's Paul saying? I have need of nothing. I don't need anything. Paul, you're in prison. You've been beaten. You've, you've been through everything that a person could possibly go through. What do you mean? I have need of nothing. I've learned the secret. It has nothing to do with my situation. It has nothing to do with my circumstance. How can Paul possibly ever bring himself to rejoice? He knows full well that contentment has nothing to do with anything in this world. It has everything to do with Christ. Look at Philippians 3. 
Look at 5. Here he is in the process of talking about if anyone has a reason to boast, it's him. And here's why. Because he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss, listen, of all things. And I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I had it all. I had it all. But he calls it rubbish. The word in the original is scubalon. It means refuse. It means garbage. The most literal translation is animal waste. Think about that. Everything is animal waste compared to knowing Christ. How can Paul say that he has need for nothing? Because everything compared to Christ is garbage. And he has Christ. So he has all. Think of all of your possessions. Think of all the money that you have right now. Take a life inventory. Can you honestly sit here this morning and say for yourself, this is a rhetorical question for you, can you say that everything in my life, I consider all of that garbage in comparison to knowing Christ? That you would happily suffer the loss of literally all of your possessions for the sake of Christ. I can tell you this. The closer that you grow to Christ, the more you start to see how empty and vain the things of this world are. The things that we spend money on, the things we spend our time on, the things that we value and prize in this commercialized culture are so empty and nothing, yet so often even those who profess Christ are right there alongside the world pursuing all of the same empty, vain trinkets. We wonder why we don't have the joy of the Lord in all circumstances. Why? It's because your joy is tied to the world. Your joy is tied to what's happening around you. Is it, can I look at my life and it's favorable? I'm happy. Is it not as favorable? I'm not as happy. Now listen, I want to be clear that a pendulum doesn't swing to the other end. This doesn't mean you cannot enjoy the common graces of this life. Your father provides and he provides well. He says, I know how to abound. This doesn't mean we all have to wear potato sacks the rest of our life. And, and swear ourselves to a life of poverty. He says, I know how to abound. It's okay to abound. The question is, do you source your joy from abounding? Are you sourcing your joy from the possessions, from bigger, better, faster, nicer, fancier? Or is your joy sourced only in Christ, how can you tell when things aren't going the way that you would want? Are you still happy in the Lord? Or are you melancholy? Are you distant? Do you pull away from everyone? Do you grumble? Do you complain? Do you say, come on, I deserve better. I want more. That's how you can tell where your joy is being sourced from. While it is, our contentment is not at all dependent upon the circumstances of life, contentment does not mean complacency. It does not mean sitting on your hands doing nothing at all, and it does not mean you can never do anything to try to change your situation. Church tradition holds here that Paul was in prison awaiting a trial before Nero so that he could appeal his charges and be free. Many times we think that contentment means I have to just sit here. Things can never get any better. Even if they're really terrible right now, I have to just sit here and just take it and never try to do anything to excel or exceed. That's not Christian contentment. Paul is here doing that. He's trying to get out of prison. 
But what is he saying? But I can be content right now. And if God leaves me here, I'm going to be content right now, not later. It is a present active verb to be content. I know how to be content right now, ongoing. And then this letter, Paul is still ministering. He's not just sitting around waiting for his situation to get better. He's still ministering right where he's at. He wrote the letter to Philemon. He wrote Philippians. He wrote Ephesians. He wrote Colossians. All while in prison. So it doesn't mean complacency. Contentment is not complacency. Contentment is sourcing your joy from Christ Jesus in every and every single circumstance. And we, are, we can be content in whatever situation we are in, because we are satisfied with what God has given or not given because we trust in His divine providence and we trust that God is ordering all things in our lives. Last and finally, it requires reliance upon Christ's power. This should sound impossible to you because it is. This is why we need verse 13 to tie it all together. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Now I know that you thought that this was a verse for athletes. This is Tim Tebow's verse, but it's not. Paul doesn't say, I can do anything. He doesn't say, I can beat the track record. He says, I can do all things. You cannot go do anything. It would not be wise of us to try and go fly by flapping our wings. It is not true that you can do anything. It's that you can do all things. Paul is expressing a great and wonderful truth. He knows that whatever God ordains for his life, he's going to provide you the power you need, the strength you need to succeed right where you are. And that's going to entail contentment, no doubt. And he wrote back in verse 11 that he has learned to be content. Again, it's a present active verb current activity. I can do. That's also current activity, present active verb. I want to reiterate the point is that contentment is not some far off unattainable virtue that's reserved for super Christians like Paul. Contentment can be had by all of us, any believer, right here, right now, because we are in Christ and he strengthens us. This also indicates that contentment is not a one-time event or a coming and going sort of virtue. It does not ebb and flow. Contentment is present and active. It is the disposition of the heart that finds its satisfaction in Christ. And along with that satisfaction, He provides us strength. Friends, like it or not, you and I are weak. We're not strong. God is not called the strong. He strengthens the weak. What did Christ tell Paul when he pleaded with him about removing the thorn in his flesh? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. He didn't say you're enough, Paul. He didn't say you're strong on your own, Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And because of that sufficient grace, Paul could go on and say that he boasts not in his strength, but in his weakness. Because when he is weak, that's when he's strong. How is that? Because when you realize how weak you are, you realize your utter dependence upon Christ for everything. You know, Jesus actually said that. He said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. But in Christ, we can do all things because he strengthens us. God has not promised us any sort of material success in this life. Anyone who tells you the otherwise is probably trying to get something from you. God has not promised us material success. He has promised us the opposite. Back in chapter 1, verse 29, Paul said that it was granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. God who absolutely ordains suffering, difficulty, pain, afflictions, and hard times for our life also empowers us to be content right in the middle of it all. So this begs the question, 
Have you been living a life of contentment? Are you sourcing your joy from the things of the world? Perhaps you're beginning to notice certain ways that you are pursuing the vain, empty trinkets of the world. Friends, this text ought to convict every last one of us because we are in a fallen world and we are fallen people. Yes, we are growing in Christ's likeness, but James says that we all sin in many ways. It's okay to say, I have been discontent because I have been pursuing the things of the world. If that's what's truly in your heart, then confess that before the Lord this morning and say to Him, they ask Him that He would cause Christ to be supreme in your life, that He would help you see Christ as all-sufficient and glorious and majestic and beautiful so that you would not so strongly desire the things of the world. But what's not okay is to deny areas if it is true that there is discontentment in your heart What's not okay for a believer at any stage of their life to say, no, that's not me. What's that worth anyway? I encourage us all to follow the example of the Apostle Apostle Paul who joyfully and willfully submitted to whatever God had for him. What a beautiful thing this is. How do we do this? How can we follow this example? We rely upon the power of Christ to strengthen us. We live independent of life's situations. We find satisfaction in whatever God does provide for us, and we trust in divine providence. Let's stand. It's fitting that we've spoken this morning of the value of Christ and the satisfaction that we find in Him alone is We will be partaking of the Lord's Supper this morning. I always want to reiterate that this is a time for believers. If you are not in Christ this morning, we are so happy that you're with us. And we would invite you to observe from your seat. If that's you and you aren't in Christ, and as you've heard of contentment this morning and the emptiness of the trinkets of this world, I would implore you to come to Christ today. Abandon the emptiness of the world. Abandon it. Abandon your self-reliance. Christ Jesus came to the world born as a man, born of a virgin. He was the God-man, truly God, truly man, walked a blameless and perfect life, and He went to the cross on our behalf where He bore your sin. He bore the sins of His people and the wrath meant for them. He died. He was resurrected, proving that his satisfaction was sufficient. He appeared to hundreds of people and then was resurrected, or I'm sorry, ascended to the right hand of the Father where he reigns today. And the scriptures promise that if you call upon him as Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, that you will be saved along with us. If that's you this morning, Believe upon Him today. Today is the day of salvation. But for those of us who are in Christ, this is a serious time of reflecting both on the sacrifice of Christ and also our own spiritual condition. And as such, we always have a moment of silence. Then we'll come forward. During this moment of silence, I encourage you to silently pray and reflect and confess your sins before the Lord so that we do not partake in an unworthy manner this morning.